All right, you're all set. Hey, I would like to uh, call a meeting of the Town Council Finance Committee to order on July 15, 2020. Uh, it is 1.35 p.m. It was a meeting posted for 1.30 p.m. Uh, this is a meeting that pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, chapter 30A, section 18 um, is uh, being conducted by a remote participation in order to um, satisfy the open meeting law fully. We, I need to confirm that members of the committee who, who are present can um, hear me and can be heard. So as I um, ask for you to indicate um, your uh, presence by saying present, we will do that. Lynn Griesmer? Present. Uh, Kathy Shane? Present. Pat DeAngelis? Present. Uh, Bob Hegner? Present. And Mary Lou Talman? Present. Okay, uh, I think that then I don't have my participant list up at the moment, but I believe that um, you we uh, have no other members who've joined since. And um, if they do, we'll in note that for the minutes as they arrive. Right, we now uh, have the quorum of the council. Okay, then uh, I need to uh, pause because the president needs to call the uh, council to order and uh, make a similar request of council members who are not finance committee members. Okay, seeing as we have a point of the Amherst Town Council, I'm calling a council meeting uh, jointly with the finance committee meeting together at 137. I'm now going to call upon various council members that are here that have not already been identified and make sure that you can hear us and we can hear you. Uh, Darcy Dumont. Here. Uh, George Ryan. I'm here. Shalini Balmilne. I'm here. And that is it for now. So I, leaving the uh, agenda just momentarily on the screen to explain the process of uh, today. There really are two items that we um, had on the original agenda that were the critical um, matters to talk about. Uh, one was to talk about what we heard in the public hearing, which we actually started to talk about at yesterday's meeting also, but I think we need to continue and try and reach some um, conclusion as to how we are going to um, report this to the council and to develop at least um, make sure that we have information that we have available to us so then when we take positions on the budget tomorrow that we can do so and then the second part of this is to discuss um, the whole process of developing a budget there is, as always, at uh, council committee meetings, unless posted is a special meeting, which the, um, when it's a special joint meeting, it wasn't intended to preclude uh, any public comment. So we will allow public comment, but not until later in the meeting after we've had the general discussion. But this is a working meeting and um, we're here to accomplish some very important business on behalf of the council um, in trying to get us to a final resolution so that uh, on what we're recommending for the operating budget because that has to be adopted and uh, we will uh, get to public comment later in the meeting um, there is some benefit to having a uh, comment come after discussion when people have can comment on the discussion that they heard. Um, members of the public who just wish to make a comment always can come back and rejoin the meeting later too if they don't have um, the time to spend the entire afternoon with the meeting but can come back. So 
if there are no questions about that, I'll take the, the off the screen so that we can get back to our <coughs> regular. We had uh, started to talk yesterday about the comments we heard, which had, um, which was a significant reduction um, recommended by a number of members of the public who spoke at the public hearing to the public safety budget and particular and specifically to the police department budget. Um, we've tried to develop um, information yesterday um, in order to help us evaluate the request and the impact of the request. And I think that that's where we probably should pick up because there were no other subjects of public comment at the meeting. Uh, so what I want to start with is opening it up to just general reactions to the request and um, whether there was information that we received uh, that yesterday that was helpful and whether there's additional information that would be helpful in order to get to a recommendation. And before um, I turn, open it up then to uh, looking to see if there are anybody who wants to speak on that subject, and I believe there are already that Kathy does, is that um, we ask Chief Livingstone to be available um, to us if um, any members of the committee feel that it would be helpful and there seems to be a committee consensus and then um, somebody from the staff um, would contact the chief and ask him to be present. We did not ask him to be present for the meeting um, as, as a whole because this is now uh, needs to be our discussion. So having said that, Kathy, I recognize, um, want to recognize you because you've asked to be recognized. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for opening with uh, a focus on the police, Andy. I thought yesterday was helpful, um, particularly uh, both to hear more from residents about their concerns um, and concepts that I think are going to take a much longer term set of what do we want to do, how would we want to do it, a long study period with a lot of involvement from the community for what they're asking for. But uh, we also heard from uh, the police chief that what my um, note said is there is one vacancy now and another one soon, like within a couple of weeks, and then a third in September. So there are three potential vacancies that as of right now, there's not been a process of earmarking that for a person coming up from the academy where we start spending money on them. So I, rather than thinking of an, a massive cut in the police department, which I don't think any of us uh, think is warranted at this point, I was going to, I wanted to open with a discussion of what if we said uh, price out the two, two of the vacancies with full salary and benefits. And if we do a police budget without them in right now, so it would be a cut, but not saying how we're planning on using the money. And then saying over the course of the next six months, the next eight months, um, we could be talking about whether we just go back and, and this would be, since the only thing we can do is reduce a budget, we can't suggest how one might spend that money. But um, looking at the total budget, it would leave the town budget below the mark that we set by guidelines. So we would be coming under the budget. Um, and so the rest of the balancing would still work, but be willing to consider um, recommendations coming back from staff once there's been a fuller community discussion on how we might fill those positions, which could be police officers, but it could be some other composition. So I wanted to get a precise number on what the salary plus benefits would be, so we're not just uh, taking averages. Um, and I quickly sent a note to Sean uh, just before the meeting, and he said he could provide that to us by tomorrow, Sean, I think you said. Um, or, sorry, um, you're, we can give you that. Sonia, do you have that together? It's a, it's between 125 and 150, depending on the um, education. 
that's total between the two positions. Total between the two positions. But I also want to point out if you cut a budget, that money is gone. It's not anywhere else to be reallocated. So be careful when you're suggesting cutting a budget. You know, I think that Kathy's proposal, and she will uh, confirm that I'm correct, is that um, the uh, manager has the option always of asking for a supplemental budget. And if during the course of the um, year, if this was uh, voted as a reduction, he felt there was a need to request an increase so that a position could be filled um that he would have he could make that request to the council yeah that's exactly what i had in mind that i understand that it's gone from the operating budget right now but that's why i said we're we're going to be coming in under budget <laughs> so it leaves room to come back to the council to say i want to expand the budget for the following reasons since we we can't my understanding is we can't designate that to just set it aside on a shelf. So we, our option is to cut the budget or not. Um, so I was trying to work within that box for, and then what I, what I see this as is, um, you know, if, if we were going to make a decision over when I say six months, eight months, 12 months, however long it takes to try to think about what, what if anything can we do? Um, you can't go from here to there quickly. And I'm sure places like Eugene, Oregon that we've heard about uh, thought long and hard about what they wanted to do and then came up with a budgeted way of doing it. So I just am looking for this as an alternative of buying us some time for the kinds of discussions and deliberations that need to happen. But while, while showing that we are hearing um, that there is broad concern not even so much on, but we heard a mix of the way the way we're being policed is being, uh, we had some examples of concerns about that, but there was also of what kinds of situations need police as opposed to need other kinds of people or people with a more in-depth knowledge of mental health, of dispute resolution. So it's like, is it possible to, put that mix in. The other thing I think we heard yesterday and earlier is there is a valuable grant funded position right now. And by the end of September, the department will know whether that position has been funded. Um, and that was funded for two years at $400,000. If it completely goes away, it this also leaves the potential of the town manager coming back to us and say, we really need that. And, and could come back with a supplemental talking about that kind of a person. So I'm looking for a way of trying to be responsive to this notion of, is the police force we need in 2020 and going looking forward very different maybe than uh, what we originally thought of. And it may be the training academies need to change substantially also, but we can't do that right now. So that, that was my thought of what we can do in terms of make a recommendation as a finance committee. So can I clarify on the budget? So if you cut the budget, right now we, our budget is based on estimated revenues. So once the tax rate is set, then you no longer have that option. The only funding source you would have to go to reserves to to add any more money to the budget once the tax rate is set. So I just want to be clear on that. Okay. Yeah. So I think what you're saying is, Sonia, to the extent this leaves us with a cash surplus we didn't expect to have, it's it would normally go into reserves, but we would have to take it back out so that we've got a piece of money. So it's not just simply that the town manager has in his back pocket some money. Uh, yeah, it's got not, it. It's not money that we have in our hand that will just fall to reserves. If right. our revenues come in less, I mean, it all it's all a matter of closing the books. It's not like taking $100,000 and setting it aside and it just automatically falls to reserve. It doesn't work that way. Okay. So, it has to be estimated on a budget, bottom line budget. Okay. Yeah, maybe a little bit more explanation of the tax setting process. 
uh, would be helpful because I think that what you're really trying to get at is that once the budget is developed, that that um, then drives the amount of the tax rate that would be set for the year. Right. And the tax rate then becomes certified um, in the fall and um, we can't raise the taxes so that if later in the year we wanted to increase the budget to fund the positions, it would not come from taxation raised during the um, fiscal year, it would come from, it would have to come from reserves. Thank you, Mandy. Can I just ask, um, and um, there are things we can't do, but the town manager could still modify a proposal to us. I mean, I understand how tight our timeline is. And so my preferred way of doing this, which we can't do as the council, the way this charter is set up, is say, take that money and put it into an account <laughs> that could then be spent on whatever's. Um, and since we can't say, take that money and put it over here, but uh, the town manager could propose it to us. But that's, that's what I have in mind. And I guess, you know, we set a budget and we've said, if there's a shortfall because of what the state does, we're going into reserves. Um, so we've, also, we've already kind of come in with that uh, formulation for the year with uh, showing how much the impact could be. So I'm, I'm still comfortable with the notion that we would have to dig into reserves to pull this money back. And I'd need to kind of understand that to what extent that undermines our ability to set taxes tax rate increases for the next year. Um, it's, it's not on our $80 million budget, it's a small amount of money. So I can see that it, somewhere it might have an impact. Well, it, it does in that, uh, and again, I tell you, if I don't get this correct, Sonia will immediately correct me, but um, the two and a half percent increase is based upon what you were allowed to tax in the previous year. And so if the tax rate is set at an amount, two and a half percent is based upon that amount. For, so in FY21, once the tax rate is set, the FY22 permissible taxation is two and a half percent above what we taxed during 21. So right, so we're setting a tax rate based on a budget that's voted. If that's not part of what's being voted, then it's not available. It doesn't fall anywhere. We didn't raise it. Okay. I I, there are other hands up, so maybe we should get to see, get some other people involved in the conversation because we can come back to this. I think, um, Paul, um, you had your hand up, and I wanted to get you in on this. Thank you. So just two quick points. One is, I think that um, it's not just it's, it is our charter, but it's also state law that regulates how councils appropriate. The initiation almost always comes from the executive side for budgets, and that's just the way the system is set up. Um, and then the second thing is, I think it might be worth it for the council to say, what do you, you know, if you are identifying what you're wanting, I think what, what Kathy is saying, I want to freeze, I don't want to fill these positions that are in the police department budget because I want to have room to be able to choose to spend that money someplace else in a different way. And this is a funding source in essence. And if you're articulating what that is, and then you, we, you know, we can go back into our finance, you know, the, talk to Sean and Sonia about how do we accomplish what that goal is, if that's what you're trying to achieve. I don't think we have to solve it in this meeting, but let us think about how that, if it requires a town manager action or something else, that might be the way, best way to conceive, con conceive what you want to accomplish and then go from there. Okay. Um, Mary Lou. Thank you, Paul. Mary Lou. Mary Lou, are you? Uh... Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my question is uh, the possibility of having the manager freeze those positions in the police department 
So we keep the money, and then when you have this wide community input, that the manager can then move that money to whatever department we're going to use to provide these services that we now want. Is that uh, under the charter? Is that permissible that you can that the manager can move money from one department to another? If that's the case, I think that can solve the problem so long as it's clear that the council wants these two positions frozen until a decision is made. Is that possible? I think the answer to that question is yes. yes. Um, the budget process in, is not all that different uh, from what you're familiar with from the town meeting days. Uh, what uh, the only difference that we have chosen to do is instead of uh, passing five different budgets for the five areas of town government, uh, we're just uh, doing it as a single vote so that transfers can be made between public safety and other departments uh, and other sections of the government without having to come back to the council. But otherwise, it's um, a similar process to what was before. So you have it correct. Okay. Uh, Lynn? Pat, I thought I saw you waving your hand, and I wanted to make sure if you, OK. Um, I'm glad that we've had this additional education on <laughs> pack setting and so forth. And given um, what we heard, and given the suggestion that Kathy's making, but also knowing that we're already dealing, uh, excuse me for saying this, with a fantasy budget anyway because we don't know what our revenues are. I would really strongly urge that we do a freeze action. And we ask the town manager to freeze whatever vacancy comes up in the police department. And that gives us the time that I think we need to better hear from people. And it also creates the greatest flexibility with the budget. That's what I'm piecing together from hearing about passing a budget, setting a tax rate, not being able to go back and do that again, and how do we keep money in reserve? So there, that's what I'm hearing. That's all right, Bob. Yeah, I, uh, Kathy, thank you for that suggestion. I had a similar idea. Um, myself, that, that these positions that the police are basically going to be vacant um, offer an opportunity to, I guess, set money aside at this point um, or uh, freeze the positions. Um, the one thought I had, too, was, uh, uh, you know, we heard that the staffing of the police needs to be available for weekends because of what goes on on the, the, the college campuses. But it seems like since it's a like a it takes a year to kind of refill a position that goes vacant, these positions essentially are going to be gone for a year anyway. Um, so I don't think that we would be. I mean, we should probably go back to to the the chief of police and find out. But I, I you know, it seems like we wouldn't be putting the police force at a disadvantage by just freezing two positions. Uh, but I think we probably ought to get that verification. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, basically, I think it's a good idea. Thanks. Okay, uh, I see George Ryan. George, did you have your hand up or not? It was there briefly. Yes, I did, Andy. Um, I guess I just, I just want to have a clear sense of what this would mean for the police department. And I don't have that sense at the moment. The chief is not here. Um, I was present the other day listening to the conversation. Um, I really do want to hear clearly from him what this actually means in terms of their ability to provide services to this town. Um, thank you. The, um, I'm going to ask 
uh, for Pat in, in, this, in just a second. Uh, as noted, if there's a consensus of the committee that someone from the staff would contact the chief, um, it's my understanding that he is available and has a link to join us. We just did not ask him to be at the meeting unless requested. Um, so, but uh, Pat. You're on, uh, we're not hearing you because you're still muted. I thought I was unmuted. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to thank Kathy and Bob because uh, we're all thinking very similarly. Um, I was uh, working on this uh, a while ago and had contacted the chief about the possible impact of not filling those two positions. Um, I think this was a week or so ago. And what he talked about was that he felt, and he needs to speak for himself, I understand that. Uh, but what he said is the community wants more traffic officers, we wouldn't be able to have, and so we need two more traffic officers. Um, and I, I wanna hear from the chief, but I do not think that's a substantial enough reason to not put this freeze in place. Okay. Um, George, I'll, you had your hand up again. I apologize, and I won't do this again, but I would like to remind everyone that we are in the midst of a pandemic. We have thousands of students returning to town. Um, I don't know who you expect to enforce um, the regulations that I assume we're going to want to enforce. Um, so this is not a normal time, and I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, so I am very concerned about any kind of change to staffing levels um, in the face of this situation where um, we are going to, I mean, that's what I'm hearing from, is people concerned about students. They're not emailing me or complaining to me about the police department. They are very, very, we have a, a, uh, a petition online that has over 500 signatures from people in the community wanting the university to not let students come back. So what I'm hearing and sensing is a deep concern about public health um, in the next few months. And so that's my main question. And I want to hear from the chief. And I'd like you all to keep in mind that um, the chief enforcement officers are the police. And we face a period of the next few months where unless I'm mistaken, this is going to be a very serious issue. Uh, Pat? Again, please. Yep. Yeah, um, I hear what George is saying, and he knows I have a lot of respect for his position, but I also um, feel strongly that the UMass police, I think, I think it was said that there were 65 officers, and I understand they can't uh, enforce bylaws and they can't arrest people, but they can um, do that on their campus, they can control and they can provide support to the Amherst police. And it seems to me that, that this is now a time when the university needs to step forward and help the town. Um, I'm also questioning, uh, I think there are valid concerns about uh, returning students, um, but I, I'm uncomfortable with the fact that um, I'm uncomfortable with the kind of discrimination that's happening and the equating, I, I can't equate death from COVID, although I don't want to experience that, with death because I'm a person of color, uh, because I, I walked in the wrong way, or that I, that I can be a demonstrator and be pushed to the ground by the police. And I'm not saying that's happening here, but people of color in our town and homeless people live with and a, an honest fear that is a public health crisis that affects their psyche. And we don't address that. And I think that we need to address that by the kinds of actions that we do. Um, so while I appreciate the people who signed the petition, I think they're letting fear dominate them. Pat, while you're um, still on, and and I've noticed that Chalini's hands up, and I'll get to her in a second too. To, 
but I thought that you and Shalini were giving some thought to the question of how we could create a community dialogue about the kind of policing that we need in the future. And um, if you're, if that, you know, what I, I'm trying, what kind of time frame is needed to really have a thoughtful process of that kind, engage the community the way that they should, and um, have a healthy plan that we can move forward with. Oh, goodness. Um, Shalane and Lynn and I have been meeting, and I think, and, and I, I think that what we have heard from the community is that they want to drive um, the decision making around this. So my feeling is over the next month or so, or I, I don't take that away. I feel like the council needs to open up channels so that we can create a civilian, um, that's the wrong word, but a, a civilian review committee of uh, not just of police actions, but of po uh, policies and procedures is sort of follow. And, and I, think we need, I think we need the year, the rest of this budget year um, and I don't, I, I'm going to step out and let Shalane or Lynn uh, step up because I'm, time frame is kind of boggling me right now in terms of, because I feel like we need to wait some, and that's tricky. I think that's yeah. tricky. Uh, the, the reason I asked the question, and I'm saying this soon, as I'm about to call on Shalane, uh, is that it would be helpful possibly for us to know the answer to that as to whether because the, I, the proposal that we're talking about is to freeze positions or to ask um, the town manager to freeze positions. And with the idea that that will allow a segue, but I was trying to get, make sure that we have the timeline fitting with um, what we're envisioning recommending. Shalini, do you have any thoughts on this or anything else you wanna contribute? Please yes, join. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I just want to share one idea that I just received from um, from Matthew Andrews, Yoga Center Amherst uh, business uh, owner, and he's. This is an article. I don't know if you read. It's the City Council in Asheville, North Carolina, and they just passed uh, the resolution for reparations in their community for Black people. And what they're doing is they are investing. Uh, budgetary and creating budgetary and programma programmatic priorities in the community where there are disparities in education, healthcare, um, um, businesses. And so that's one model that we could look at. And, and basically the idea is that we're reinvesting in those specific areas where there, there are these disparities. And to do that, in North Carolina, in Asheville, what they're doing is they're creating this community reparations commission, inviting community groups and other local governments to join. So that's one idea I think that we can look at. And the second thing that based on what I've been hearing in our own community is it's not so much about how our police have been doing or not doing, but it's really, we need a radical shift in how we even look at what does a safe community look like for all residents. And, and, and so I, we do need a few more meetings to hear from the committee and whether it's with co-hosting those with Human Resources, uh, Human Rights Commission or just the grassroots level. So it really does involve listening a little bit more. And I do feel to address the systemic issues and to invest in a thoughtful manner, we need sort of a steering committee of some sorts. And, and using the word reparations, I think might be beneficial because it's really acknowledging that this wrong has been done. And, and now we're actually taking steps of reinvesting in a thoughtful manner. Those are some things coming up for me. Thank you. Um, Lynn, since you were named as a third party to those discussions as to how we move forward. Right. So let me just step back a little and say, um, 
Oh my gosh. Um, about a month and a half, almost two months ago, uh, Shalini and Pat were invited to join a group of residents who had asked for a meeting with the police chief. It, that was one of several meetings and I understand that residents had asked, but it's the only one I'm aware of at least counselors were asked to. And so I was in touch with both of them and asked specifically that they start helping us think about how we kind of set up a process of listening and then taking action and so forth. I'm not suggesting any one action is the appropriate thing. We then we also then met, and by the way, um, Pat was very kind and made sure all counselors were aware of that meeting. And I believe that a form of the council was actually on the attendee side. So we did not have a committee meeting, but we did clearly have a great number of counselors listening. Then Pat and Shalini and I met with the civil, uh, with the Human Rights Commission. Um, and they specifically took some action and said that they would do some convening of local residents around this. And the, the only meeting that I am actually personally aware of is the one that took place last, last Saturday where they brought a consultant in and it was really about systemic racism. It was an excellent uh, workshop, particularly for people like myself who don't see it as much as maybe I, as I clearly need to, but it was not a dialogue and it could not be a dialogue because we have had this horrendous racist Zoom bobbing that has now come in on at least one of our town meetings and uh, absolutely and completely upset people. Um, so the, what is not happened yet is that return at least to the best of my knowledge. What has happened is a group of people in our community have been very attentive to the national movement about defunding and disarming police. And they have joined together and become appropriately vocal and let us make sure we heard what they're thinking about, which we want all community people to do. But what's missing at this point is time. And what's missing at this point is a plan. And the only thing that will get us to a plan is time. And the only thing that will get us to time is to do something where we say, how could we preserve whatever money we can in this year's budget and keep it there for something down the road that is well thought out, well planned, proposed, brought back to the council, brought back to the town, uh, to the residents at large and adopted. And I'm, I hate I hate when people aren't willing to be patient and give people time, um, but I also totally understand the impatience of residents in our community. So while we are continuing to hopefully have some of that time, we also need to continue to have the conversations with the police department to take the questions that I have now collected as of Monday make sure that they are given to the police, which I will do when I have a moment to do it, and that we get responses to those so that we keep the dialogue going with our police department in a way that keeps them engaged and they have absolutely, totally expressed their interest in being engaged. So I, we have willing parties. We need time to get a plan and we need a plan where there's some money to fund it. So Kathy, now you started us out and you've heard a lot. So where, do you, where are you now? Okay, so I wanted to come back to the point George made um, about the fear uh, of the student returning because I had someone call me today in a panic. But what, her, what she was asking for is, it's interesting. She was asking for a follow-up poll actually on your statement letter to the chancellor. <laughs> 
that let's get Tony Maroulis, one of our police, something involved where the university steps up to the plate and there are consequences for people living off campus, not abiding by masks and social distancing. Because right now, um, you know, as you know, I sent a couple resident concerns that there were 15 kids without masks on, but they were in their backyard. And so the police have limited ability right now to go into someone's backyard. If, uh, and her, hers were 30 or more people. She said some of the rental houses, people aren't living in them, but they're bringing all their friends in for the weekend. <laughs> and so, you know, you've got cars and people. And this is a uh, person who's in the middle of chemotherapy who's in her 80s. So she has zero immune defenses. But hers wasn't more police. And she bought in Bill Laramie, you know, is from neighborhood. And she said he was extremely responsive on a concern. But I started thinking of, you know, this notion of can we convene some people with the public health nurse? She accepted the public health nurse. Can we get uh, do we have emergency bylaw that we could do that allows us onto public property because it's a state of emergency and it's a health crisis, but have the university back us up for, for behaviors. And hopefully once that, and her, you know, it's uh, that they get sent home, you know, that you can't stay at the university if you're behaving this way, either on or off campus. So it wasn't a call for more police. It was really a call for a different, you know, a, a action. Um, but, you know, I said, you know, they have the ability to find, she said, oh, no, I don't want to find, you know, I, not a dollar amount. I just, I just want people to uh, know that they can't be outside with huge numbers of people without masks. And um, a lot of people weren't even from our community, they were bringing friends in. So this notion of people coming in. So I think that is an issue, but that's a different kind of issue. And Paul, you can step in, but I had sent you one person who was saying it's 10 people now, it's 15. And you asked, is it on their property or is it on the street? And it was on their property. So we were limited other than police. So she was saying, can the public health nurse come in, you know, and be a health officer coming in? So it, it's trying to think of how do we address that concern, which is going to be pockets of the community. Um, and this particular person lives next door to a house. I saw it, it has, I don't know how many people live in the house, but it had 15 cars regularly parked in their driveway as of last year. So her, and she always holds an annual party for the students coming back. I mean, it's a very much a welcome to the community. So it wasn't a, we don't want, but it was, the giant festive things. So it, it feels like it's a separate, separable issue that we're not prepared to deal well with now, even with police. Um, so I do think, you know, this was, I was gonna bring it up by email to you, Paul, but I don't know what else can be done, but she loved when I talked about what was in your letter to the chancellor about, you know, so, so it is that on-campus, off-campus fear. So I just, um, I thought the idea of freeze was, that's what I wanted to say, but I didn't know whether we can freeze. So you've told us a way we could get to, we've got money reserved in the budget, which is what I wanted to be thinking of doing. And these vacancies feel like a way to do it because it's in the police department. Paul? So a couple of things, yeah. Um, and going to, I, like, I don't know if you've got a dozen people downstairs from you right now in your house. We're not going to go into people's houses and investigate <laughs> if you've got too many people and if they're wearing masks. That's not our role. Private property is different. We respond to nuisance complaints based on externalities that emanate like noise that come beyond the, the, the frame. Pandemic is totally different. So your, your constituent who said, I used to have a big party. Well, that, you know, she could still do that, but we would that would be frowned on now. So it's complex. I mean, I think we, we are, I mean, my letter is pretty explicit about what we feel um, that economic consequences for students is not going to likely Im influence behavior. Courts are not open. That's not a real serious avenue for us. We think the university has to have academic uh, impacts and we can't, that's what we're asking them to do. Um, if there's a if there's a a consistent issue and there's a, you know they they're the university is used to dealing with lots of different behaviors with with students they, that's they're really good at that actually um, we're just saying expand that to off campus as well 
because we want to be a team. I'm not sure if you saw the Tulane letter, very good letter, very explicit. I can send that to you if you didn't. Um, it was unambiguous. Nobody could understand, would misunderstand what Tulane was saying to their students off and on campus. Um, so yes, it's and it's our public health and police and you know everyone and we work really well together. Those folks get together every week to review things. It's a it's a well exercised team that addresses every complaint that comes in. They look at every log. So I don't think that I think it's we've got the people in place to do that. It's about expanding our 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 tool set to be able to enforce things and to recognize that the number of complaints will increase because people will be much more sensitive to gatherings. So, and we're in educating our dispatch office, dispatchers and things like that. On the, uh, to Lynn's point in some ways, I, I do appreciate what she said. I think what she said is act totally spot on, you know, public safety, you know, police and public health are really eager to talk about this alternative way of interacting with people that we think is, is and what the community has said and very uh, eloquently said yesterday is that um, there are better ways, there might be better ways to respond in the way we do it now. And everybody's like on board with that. And, you know, we've looked at, you know, Den Denver and Albuquerque have introduced new models recently that are more aligned with the CAHOOTS model and Eugene. So there are a lot of communities that are having this exact same conversation. We're not alone. And so, um, being in touch with how people are conceiving this and saying, yeah, for all these mental health and things like that, maybe a police officer, it fell to the police department because they were the only people there 24 hours a day. Let's staff up a different way. And so I think we're all in, want to have that conversation about how we deliver that service uh, to the public. And um, so I think that th there's a willingness among the professional staff and um, because I think that is the next phase of of policing or whatever we call it, you know, it's, it's responding to needs of the community. Really, it's not even policing, and maybe they're not the right people to do it. Or, and but the way they do it now, they're really well trained. We even had testimony yesterday about the community, the CIT training that we've received. We and they appreciated that. But you know, there's just it's very complex. So, and having a social worker or somebody trained showing up the night the next day, probably you know, might makes a lot of sense to a lot of folks. You know. So, so again, um, enforcing and dealing with the pandemic, I think is gonna be highly complex. We're gonna to have to have a lot of willingness and um, education of our own police force because they're gonna be the ones who receive the call. Um, and then also, I think the time to look at something to let you know that the staff is super willing and interested. And we're gonna, we will have this conversation one way or the other, but giving us the tools, you know, uh, and if you're, if we're in a line, just want to make sure that we're in alignment, which it sounds like we are with the, with the council. So I'm going to turn it back to George because he started us on this path. And I think it's worth uh, trying to finish it out to see if we've got the answers that he was looking for, because that I heard George, you saying right at the beginning was that you want to make sure that if we freeze positions, uh, for hiring that it doesn't affect um, our ability as a community to keep us safe during the COVID crisis. Thank you, Andy. First, Bill Laramie is the police. And imagine if uh, the chief says, well, you know, you just froze three positions. I've got to take Laramie and put him somewhere else now. We need to really know what the impact of any kind of freeze will have on our police department. That's my concern. And if I can be shown that, that the impact is minimal in regards to public safety, which includes now the COVID crisis, I'm copacetic, but right now I have no idea. So Bill is the police. Um, secondly, the university in kind of any kind of sanction, I think Paul is right, um, fines and, and, and you know expulsions are not on the table, but the university does have a mechanism to punish students and misbehave. It's been used a lot or it's been used and they know how to use it but they must have a police report. So, you know, you can go and talk to them as much as you like as a neighbor, but that does not get to the university. So if you actually expect to have enforcement that has some teeth to it um, from the university side, they need police, uh, a police report. So that's my deep concern. Um, I don't, well, the other issues are for another day, but that's my 
deep concern here is what impact, no matter how well intentioned, a freeze on our police department will have at this particular time. It seems to me seriously concerning. Um, Shalini? I just had a clarifying question uh, from, uh, so Paul, can you tell us if if the wearing the masks and all of that is advisory and not an order, then can what role does the police even play in addressing these issues in town? Like, you know, as, as we're in with respect to George's question. So it depends if it's on proper f private property or, or public property. So if it's public property, it's, it's an advisory. Um, we are having signs put up. I'm not sure if they're in yet in key mm -hmm. sort of denser areas downtown, mo mostly in other villages to it, be more explicit about wearing masks and things like that. Um, but it, we have not, um, we, we always stayed in alignment with the governor who said it's an advisory, it's not a requirement. Um, on private property, we go in and we try to educate and express concerns. And usually people are receptive, but sometimes they are not, especially with police officers can not, might not be. So that's why we're looking for support from the university in those types of situations. So then what role, I mean, how would that affect, Joy's question was that by cutting out these positions, we may be impacting the public safety related to coronavirus. But if they can't really enforce, there's nothing to enforce there, what role do we see them playing? I think that the, the council and we are getting lots of concerns from the public. And right. if we say there's nothing, we, we can't show up, we always respond to something one way or the other. So if okay. someone says, I'm concerned about this household, we'll send someone there and, and have a conversation. Okay. 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 Thank you. Lynn? Uh, George actually made one statement, and that is Bill Laramie is the police. And so it's a it's what's called a com community policing model. And we have examples that have worked extremely well in this community. The thing I do want to point out, and the reason why I sent an email to the council earlier today asking you to also reserve the 21st, as well as even the 28th, on your calendars for council meetings, should we need them, is that on our Monday agenda is an item to discuss the memo to UMass, the budget, and voting. And those three items alone could take hours. And the public comment about any one of those could take hours. And I think our meetings have worked a whole lot better when they end by 10 o'clock uh, for everybody involved. So I just want to point out that policing and public health are related. And I think we need to go back to George's question and we need to decide whether to have Scott come in and answer it now or be available to answer it Monday or whenever. But the impact of any cuts, whether they be two positions or 52% need to be well understood by our community before they, as we go forward with any decision. We are in charge of public safety. And if we do things that so damage the public safety of our town, then it's on us. We are also in charge of the attitudes and aptitudes of the citizens of our town, and that's on us too. So let me just pause for a second, then I'm going to give their two hands up, and I'm going to call on people who have their hands up, of course. Uh, is there a consensus that we should ask somebody from the staff to um, call the chief and see if he can join us to respond to that question that has been raised about what the effect of uh, uh, freezing positions is on being able to continue the community policing model and responding to COVID and other things. Um, I'm looking for sort of either a yes or a no, um, sort of real quick. 
I see one nod from. That's, I see two. No, I, okay. I, th I think I think so. As long as he knows what he's responding to, so you know if he yeah. comes in and yeah. So we have tomorrow also, but if he can join us today, that'd be great. Well, he's, prepared. He, he's prepared. And he was given an invitation to join. We just suggested that he not join unless we called. Paul, is there somebody who can uh, give keep a call? Yes, I'll send him a link right now. Okay. No. Kathy, uh, Kathy, you had your hand up, so. No, I up. just I just want to say that I um, quickly Googled the Tulane letter and what Tulane has done to help their community is said groups of more than fifteen. If you do it, you are potentially at risk of being expelled. They weren't they weren't light in their enforcement wording. And they did it in reaction to July four, a July 4th set of weekend parties everywhere. So I think this point about can either the on-campus police at UMass or UMass itself give us a tool we don't have right now of raising the stakes uh, would be extremely important. Because um, I think just throwing people at this, if we can't go into somebody's backyard and do anything other than saying you're misbehaving. Um, it's, you know, it, 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 it feels like you drive the car over there and you say, and, and in the person who called me, it was in a backyard. It wasn't in her ha house. So she was just looking outside. Um, so I think we do need, that's called, Paul's calls it a tool. I call it a hammer. Um, it's a good tool. <laughs> it's a big one. Um, so it would be great if you can move on something much stronger from the university to get us through at least the fall semester. By the way, Pat, I would wonder, Pat particularly, I'm thinking, we went to a joint session. We all sat in a big circle under the pavilion over at Mill River and both uh, Officer Laramie and uh, Captain Ting were there. and. Mm. I think I had a better understanding for the first time, uh, a better understanding, I had some understanding before, of what they can and what they can't do. Right. And I wonder if for our meeting on Monday, it would be useful for them to talk about that as well during the COVID discussion about UMass. I think that is valuable. I also want to say in terms of that meeting, there were realtors and building managers there who were also facilitating um, changes in their tenants. Um, and so that's another element that we need to think about having some, uh, and again, that was vol that's voluntary, but I thought that they were really responsive. Now, Lynn, I have to leave that to you as council president because it, you mentioned yep. three possible yep. agenda items it really fits under two of them potentially and how you organize it and which of them it really belongs to, but uh, the suggestion of bringing somebody in who's a property manager too, to talk about their challenges in addition to the police department challenges. And the the one I want to bring in is the one that I think sounds exemplary, although I've only heard one, and that's the one from Vertex. And mm -hmm. follow up, when they find out there's been a complete police complaint over the weekend on Monday morning, they're at the doorstep of the tenant's place following up. And I'm like going. Hey, shall we? Yeah, following up on what everyone is saying, it sounds like we could um, get in touch with major stakeholders like the univer university, uh, landlords, businesses, and then find out what are the different mechanisms, whether it's a hammer they can offer or whether it's education or like uh, the business district has provided uh, masks to all the businesses and they're encouraging the businesses to offer so if someone is coming in without a mask to give them a free mask and some education or so I think not just relying on police to take care of it but involving all the key stakeholders in our town and using all the mix of all of these different tools and strategies. Good point. Hey. It will be helpful when the university gets beyond telling Paul that they're studying his letter and actually get to reply. <laughs> they said they're studying. <laughs> Every time I hear them talk about it, that's what they're saying. Uh, George? 
just very quickly, the, be wary of how much you can expect the university to do. I'm not saying you shouldn't insist or ask or demand, but I know for, for a fact that they are very reluctant to use expulsion. Um, and I think they have good reasons why. So um, maybe they'll yield on that. But I, when I've had conversations with various people, expulsion is, is not something they take seriously. They don't think it's effective. And obviously it's their state university. Um, I believe Tulane, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Tulane is a private university. I believe, maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, expulsion is not uh, something that they are at all eager or perhaps even willing to use. Yeah, shall we? Oh, just, yeah, okay. Could we, uh, why are we not considering contact tracing? I was in Burlington at a restaurant and uh, where whatever services we use, they had forums and where they had all people signing up and it just makes people more conscious, I think. And just signing that people are, you know, knowing that there is something serious going on. And also it does help with the contact tracing. So is there any reason why we're not considering that in our town? Paul? So, so we are. I mean, if you go to a restaurant, they're supposed to be, and they've done it to me when I've gone to restaurants, they take your name and number and they keep it on a list for that day. So there is contact tracing for the town hall. You have to log in. If you anybody who walks in the building has to be logged in, but that's for contact tracing purposes. So every business under the uh, governor's orders are supposed to maintain contact tracing. So, you know, we went to a restaurant and we, they asked for our phone number and name and we, we said, well, we're not looking for takeout. And they said it was for contact tracing. So if that's not happening, you should let us know. We'll follow up with that. Oh, got it. That's Doing good to know. Yeah, I don't think the restaurant I went to offered us a sign of a form, but but I can it yeah, but I'll form. keep a look. They, they oh, were just, no they, oh. they don't need to have a form. Some people might have it, but they're just taking a list. They just have to maintain a list. Okay. Got it. Okay. I'll look out for that then. Thank you. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, George? Would we consider limiting the size of public gatherings? Um, even even though the governor has his own number, could we consider lowering it? The Board of Health could um, for for in public, but again, we we tried to not create more confusion to people, and um, so um, so the chief is having a hard time cut getting in, unfortunately. Why don't you have him come in as an attendee, and then? Um, I think they can bring him in in as a participant. He, he's trying to dial in. Um, oh, no. Athena, is there any way you can help on this? Um, do you want to share my cell with him, and I can give him sure. support? Sure. Okay. Um, but I think that where we're going towards is that um, we seem to want to have the section on public safety in some ways talk about what our long-term vision is um, for the kind of thoughtful study we want about what public safety looks like in Amherst, that the effective way to get there is not by a percentage cut to the police department, but by a more limited um, freeze on positions at the present time, explain about what we learned yesterday about the amount of staff available and the fact that there are normal times only four officers available. And um, that means if there are two emergencies that need two officers, that it's depleted the entire available force. Um, and a little like explaining a little bit of the staffing and the, the community expectation. Um, and I think that the one point that um, somebody made to me afterwards was that there's a large number of ordinances that are just not going to be able to be enforced. Um, all of the noise violations and um, party violations things of that nature um, that just even um, so many traffic kinds of things, there's just going to be no response to them because there, and there'll be no one to enforce it. 
So we have all of these, uh, uh, all of these uh, bylaws in place, but the bylaws are going to be unenforceable if we don't have somebody to enforce them. Uh, Mary Lou. Uh, yes, I I would be curious to know from the chief if um, reducing his ability to hire more people would result in police not getting to a, a 911 call for a met, a EMT. They are, I don't think people realize how helpful that is. In our situation, we used them twice last year, the ambulance, the police arrived first because they're on the road, but they're a very calming and a helpful presence there before the ambulance gets there. Uh, and they begin emergency care. I've thought about, since this has come up, what if I had been there and I had to wait for assistance from South Hadley? I would have been there by myself with no one to support me with our medical emergency. And there are a lot of seniors in this town, or even people who aren't seniors, who, who find the police very helpful, calming, it, it just makes for a good situation in a bad situation. So my concern would be, would the police be able to go out be, and get there before the ambulance and help with that situation? And I don't know that. And I, it gets back to what George has been asking. Um, so there are things that we're, I think we're not aware of that they do. And it, when I looked at the, uh, the log for the fire department and ambulance calls, there's about 3,000 of them. And I'd be curious from the chief, how many of those the police arrived before the ambulance? Uh, we did not ask that uh, of uh, Chief Nelson yesterday, though he did speak a little bit about the importance of hey, the- Hey, Paul, I'm in now. Uh, Chief, hi. Hi, Welcome. Andy. So um, what it, this discussion has been about, and I'll try and encapsulate it, and uh, my fellow counselors in the committee will supplement if I don't uh, get it stated correctly, that uh, there is a lot of interest in having um, the kind of discussion that we talked about before this uh, citizen demand came to our attention about looking carefully and in a thoughtful way of, at, at your department and its policies and how it moves forward, but that uh, a wholesale cut of any percentage is not a means to get us there. And that, uh, so the, the suggestion that was put on the table at the beginning of this meeting, which is um, just totally now counselors and citizen members of the uh, finance committee was about um, just saying, what if we freeze two positions and don't hire those two positions so that we have some uh, flexibility going forward and uh, that during that period of time we engage in what could be a year-long process um, and uh, move us in that direction and then if um, with the caveat that if the town manager recommended filling a position um, that that would could be considered so we hadn't we were trying to figure out the mechanics of that but what we're also getting into more fully is what the policies um, are, are the, the practical side of it was, which then led into a question from Councillor Ryan, and he can speak for himself. George Ryan is also present at sure. this meeting. And George's question was uh, the recognizing uh, how important somebody like uh, Bill Laramie is to the department and the work that he is presently doing. If there was a freeze in positions, would there be a possibility that his current assignment would have to be changed because he would be needed for another role? 
And um, so I think that that was the, how the conversation has been flowing. And um, George, did I state that correctly as far as the conclusion? I think, uh, though Laramie is a good example, I think overall my question simply to the chief is uh, given potential of a freeze of two to three positions, what impact that would have on his ability to keep our community safe, particularly in the time of COVID-19. Um, but that's that's my question. Yeah, so thanks, George. And, and I think a lot of people are very familiar with the work that Bill's done over the last several years. and what we were going to do before, you know, everything that has happened with this budget process was we were going to expand the role that not only Bill has, but with other officers. So we were going to move once we got fully funded to move other officers into additional roles to um, complement Bill's position. So we were going to add additional officers, community police initiatives and that sort of thing we would not be able to do that. And we were specifically looking at neighbors that were less represented um, and, and accomplish what Bill has done in other neighborhoods, you know, because his, most of his work has been done with the student groups. So we would not be able to do that if we're going to freeze the two positions. Um, Bill's position in particular would probably remain the same if we only froze two positions, if we started talking about more than that, then he would probably be reduced to two days of community outreach and he would have to go back to two days of patrol, so uniform service. So it would have an effect, um, you know, if, if, we're, if somebody doesn't take a vacation day, so it would be very something that's very fluid. You know, if we have a full complement of officers, he might be able to do it three days a week. If somebody's taking a vacation day, it may be two days a week. So that's something that would be, um, moving continuously but if we were just really talking about not filling two positions probably 80 percent of the time bill's position he would be able to you know stand pat and that what we wouldn't be able to do is expand that role does that make sense you're getting some nods so uh, that makes are sense. you hearing me yes are you uh, hearing me yeah, just, um, can you hear me? Uh, this is Kathy uh, Scott. Um, Hi, Kathy, yes, I can. So the other issue that came up, um, you know, I'm looking at the service calls that you go out on medical assists, um, and out of the uh, 17,000 plus, you had about 780 of them, or 782 in the past year. Would you still be able to staff those? With a two position freeze? Um, probably, um, again, it, it's going to be determined, a lot's going to be determined by how many officers take a day off on a particular day or, or that sort of thing. Um, you know, because we wouldn't be filling positions necessarily and we would be running short on certain shifts, but if, if an officer called out sick or something like that, we may not be able to, you know, respond to what we normally would. So it's not a concrete answer about how many calls we wouldn't be able to respond to, but it really goes day to day. Okay, but yes, you. it would be affected. The other question that came up uh, from the discussion was, we are in the midst of a COVID-19 crisis that is gonna be lasting for a while. And uh, what do we envision over the next, uh, over this fiscal year for responding and how would, Freezing positions affect the um, our ability to do what is wise to do under that circumstance, and recognizing that it takes time to fill positions too. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think I explained that yesterday. Um, the the process of filling a position usually is a year long process, and that's if we have candidates available because we don't know when academy dates are starting and there's only one academy in Western Massachusetts. So the time frame for um, when we're going to have somebody in the academy and when they're going to be graduating and then the 14 week process of training them is another non constant. So we don't always know. For instance, we have an academy that just graduated 
the next academy isn't starting until September, and that one's already filled. So then the next academy after that wouldn't be until March or April of 21. So, you know, if we wanted to fill positions, it wouldn't happen immediately. Okay, thank you. Other questions, uh, of, uh, Chief? Pat? Uh, just a quick one, um, Chief. If you were hiring an officer from Hadley or something like that, an officer, an experienced officer, uh, do they go through, they wouldn't, who's already been through academy and has been working? Is that a, a it seems like that would let, take less time or what, or am I wrong about that? Just curious. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And we've done that here and there. Um, you know, we've hired a couple of guys that have had training experience already. Uh, most recently, we hired a kid that we worked at Nantucket Police Department. And uh, we've hired another officer that worked on the Cape as well. So if they have prior training and they meet the standards that we have, um, you know, either military and or uh, a college degree, and then they go, to, they still go through the vetting process of psychological exams and interviews and that sort of thing, but they don't have to go to the academy. I do want to say to you as an aside that Cyrus Cox says that the Amherst Police Department is exemplary in terms of how they uh, use psychological testing. Um, so I want to give you kudos for that. Thank you. Yeah, so he's a good guy. I've known him for a million years and um, um, certainly uh, know him well. So um, just going in order, George. So Chief, is it fair to say that given your, your current staffing levels and your current needs, that if there's a freeze on hiring of at least two positions, that will definitely impact your ability to um, provide the services the town expects from you and your department? Totally fair to say, and the biggest impact would be on our out community outreach, George, um, the things that Bill Laramie does. Um, well, he's specifically responsible for the reduction in call volume and the work that he's done and then the follow up that the police officers do, you know, through his, you know, organization skills and stuff as far as getting people in the proper place to have officers at meetings and the work that he's done with the University of Massachusetts. All of that is very, very indicative of the work he's done for call reduction and not only that arrest numbers. I think most of you, you know, have checked back through the years. Our call numbers are down and our arrest numbers are down from 12 or 1300 to about 750 and you know it's a lot specific to the work that Bill's done. Lynn? Yeah, um, I, first of all, when you call somebody a kid, I just want to say at my age, you're all kids. So just I do the same thing and I make that mistake all the time. Uh, my wife is always telling me to stop it. But yes, <laughs> I call Gabe Singh a kid and he's 45 years old, so. Yeah, right. Um, so earlier we also got into the conversation about hiring people for traffic cops. And I want to yes. just, you know, when I think of a traffic cop, I think of the guy standing in the middle of, of the intersection at Lund in London going this way, that way, and tooting his whistle. But I have a feeling we may be talking about speeding. We are, um, when, I, when I speak about traffic officers, those are the officers that are not doing traffic post at construction sites. I'm talking about officers who are specifically designated to go to streets, neighborhoods, um, and do speeding enforcement, stop sign enforcement. I, I get, a, if I get, the most emails I get from people pre-COVID and everything else was about speeders and traffic violations in neighborhoods. So when I'm speaking about a traffic officer, that's what I'm speaking about. It's not somebody who would be independently hired by a paving company or the Western Mass Electric people when they're you know, moving wires, that's, that's a independent type thing they do off duty. Well, when I'm speaking about traffic officers, I'm speaking about officers who are police officers working a regular shift, whose sole responsibility is to do traffic enforcement, speeding violations, stop sign violations, you know, that sort of thing. Right. 
and the reason that this comes up is because even now in this era of COVID, what we are hearing from people about speeding is you're, there's a lot more people walking, there's a lot more people pushing baby carriages. You almost hit my, you know, somebody almost hit my five-year-old and me pushing the baby carriage. And so actually I've been surprised at the amount of speeding complaints we're hearing. Um, yeah, there's a lot of them, um, and there's very specific neighborhoods like Southeast Street, Bay Road, Pine Street, East Pleasant Street, and North Pleasant Street up by Puffin Village are ones that we um, receive complaints about a lot, but I think Gabe Ting brought up the other day about calls we've had on Wildwood Lane and Autumn Lane and those sorts of things, so they come in at all different t times of the year. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes it's very specific times, like during the school year, parents are concerned about speeders between the hours of seven to nine when school buses are running, that sort of thing. Okay. So um, it varies. Okay. Thanks, Strat. Thank you for clarifying Challenge. traffic. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to move it along. Challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so while, okay. so while we're considering, um, whether to hire two more police people, we're also considering hiring people or having people to address the mental health issues. So if you did yep. hire those people, would that reduce some of the burden of your police? Thanks for that, Shalini. Um, I think it's a great idea to go in that direction, but I, I can also tell you that the social services agencies, CSO, ServiceNet, Bay State Health, Bowie Dickinson Health, um, are not prepared to do that with small amounts of money. That is something I think we're going to need to look at at a regional approach to. Like, let's say, mm -hmm. for instance, we cut if, if they cut 50% of my budget and $2 million went to that, those agencies, that really wouldn't change how they can operate. It needs to be looked at at a regional approach to mm -hmm. how we, we do things. It's not just the town of Amherst they're responsible for or trying to help the town of Hadley, the town of Northampton, all use the same agencies that we use, and they just don't have the ability to respond to calls at any time. It's even 8 to 4, 4 to 12, or midnight to 8. They, it just, it, this needs to be, there needs to be a plan in place to um, look at how we're going to have social services networks respond to all police departments, not just Amherst. And, um, you know, cutting one police department's budget isn't going to solve the problem. We would still be getting calls from people about mental health problems and mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Your follow-up, no, I was just curious if there are any models, but that's another discussion for another time. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Pat? Mm -hmm. Pat. Yeah, just a, a quick clarification, um, Chief. A traffic officer, uh, the guy is dressed in brown. Um, what kinds of enforcement powers do they have, and could they replace an officer who was monitoring um, Speed uh, sign, you know, uh, and monitoring for speeding in a neighborhood. So, yeah, the guys that are dressed in brown are just parking enforcement officers. All they have the authority to do is write parking tickets. They don't have police powers. So, yes, they, they would not be able to write tickets, pull people over, that sort of thing. Thank you. You're welcome. Mary Lou? Uh, yes, Chief. <clears throat> In the past, well, we've been told that for the size of Amherst, even including UMass and the uh, police at Amherst College, that we're still <clears throat> under what has been advised for, for, this, for this town. So my question is, is that still true today? And if it is, <clears throat> and then we're considering maybe cutting two more, that puts you way back. Would that be correct? That would be correct. I mean, th there's a national model out there that is put out by the Department of Justice and through the FBI, and 
some agencies follow it. Most of the ones in California follow it and some other um, jurisdictions, but it's usually around 2.5 officers per thousand residents. It's give or take a little bit there. So no matter how you cut it, if you look at Amherst, it just without the students, you know, whatever we're at at 30,000 people. And then, you know, during the daytime, I've heard the number is as high as 100,000 people who come and go um, or, you know, 65,000 when students are in town. We're below the level that we should be, and we've been at the below the level where we should be for many years. As, uh, I think it was in the re one of the reports I did for you. You know, we've been funded as high as 52 officers back in 2007, I think it was. And um, Chief Sherpa confirmed that with me. But um, we should, if we go by those standards, I think 55 officers is what they recommend. We've never been that high. Um, it prevents us from doing some of the things we'd like to do. And traffic enforcement is one of them. Having dedicated officers assigned to traffic enforcement would be one of those, but also expanding our community outreach groups, Bill Laramie, we wanted a specific team to deal with off-campus issues and also with other community members who were looking for assistance from us. And we've never been able to accomplish that with the staff that we have. So yes, Mary Lou, that's a long answer to a short question. Um, could you remind me how many officers we now have, or the whole total police department? So we are budgeted at 48. Um, and right now, we just had three officers graduate on July 10th, so we're at 47. So we have one vacancy, we have one officer retiring next week, and we have another officer retiring September 1st. And that will take you down to 45? That's correct. Okay, thank you. So I think that where we started from, uh, and like bring back, Kathy, I see your hand up. But just the budget, the budget book says 50, so that's just what I'm wondering. It says 50 FTEs in the police department, so I'm just wondering about, the, are we budgeting? That might be, yeah, that might be because we have, that might be total police employees, not uh, is, police officers, but we have a full-time administrative assistant and a full-time records clerk. Okay. There are 48 officers. Okay, that's them. right. Yeah. Thank you. So I think that where we started from in this was that um, we were trying to um, get an understanding if we wanted to create flexibility so that as we go through the kind of process that we've described where we would have uh, you know, a community, a thoughtful community process on trying to look at how we uh, arrange uh, policing and want to be able to have the flexibility to move to that transition if the transition um, is to take place. Uh, what, how do we attain that flexibility? And I think that the question came up about freezing positions in order to allow us to have that flexibility. Kathy, you, um, did I state that? Barely, do you think? Yes. Okay, so that's that's what we're trying. We're struggling with, Chief, and uh, I understand. Thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, I, I get the conversation, um, and I know that you guys are under a great deal of pressure as well from certain community members um, to to make cuts. I just, you know, I don't think any cuts are reasonable because we won't be able to accomplish what, in my opinion, is probably the best police department in New England. And, uh, you know, the types of conversations we're having now are trying to really have an effect on the younger officers, especially because they haven't been through this. So, I mean, I understand what you guys are going through as well, but I mean, the, the police officers read the newspapers, they, they hear things, there's a lot of rumors going around. So, you know, it's having a negative effect on them as well. I appreciate that and I feel very badly about that. I don't know that how we can run interference except continuing on in what we hope is a responsible manner as a council and getting to the right place. Um, 
uh, that's what we're, we're struggling with. But we really do appreciate what everyone in your department is doing. In, um, with I know you do, Andy, and I know, um, you know, there's a lot of support in the community. I wish more of them were vocal. Um, I think people are, well, there's no easy way to say it. I think people are afraid to speak up right now. Um, I don't uh, quite understand why, but uh, people have told me that. So um, I think there's more support out there than we realize. Um, so it's kind of the position we're in right now, um, both with police agencies and I'm sure with the town council as well. Uh, if you have a few more minutes, please stay with us. I do. Uh, Lynn, you and you. Yeah, I, I actually want to echo what you're saying. I had a resident call me today um, very much in support of the police. Um, in previous work that she's done, she's received hate mail and phone calls and stuff like that because of her yes. work. And um, she is very concerned about speaking out and being identified. Having said that, I don't think any of this dismisses nor suggests that we don't have a lot of work to do to look at a good model that better suits our community and continue to work on the anti-racism that is clearly among us. And I um, hope that um, whatever the council does, that message continues to be very clear. You know, I agree with that, Lynn, and I kind of look for, I was hoping we were just going to, you know, pass a budget and, and move forward and then have the discussions about how to, you know, potentially through conversation, see where we can be as an agency with assistance from, you know, social services agencies, because I can tell you that every police officer I've spoken with would be like, yeah, it would be great if we didn't have to respond to all these calls for mental health. How do we reach there? How do we get there? But I don't think just cutting police positions is the best place to start. It needs to start with more communications and, and, and meetings and discussions and seeing where, I mean, people should be reaching out to the social service agencies, to the heads of those, because I can tell you right now, they're nervous that the police aren't going to be there to respond for those calls that they can't respond to. So. Yes, I agree. Um, as I said yesterday, having been in positions where I was working with uh, domestic violence victims, and we work very closely with Safe Passage, to not have the police's partner in that um, effort to protect victims, um, it would have been impossible. Um, right. Mary Lou? Uh, you've already called on me. Thank you. I think okay. my phone dropped. That's happened. <laughs> okay, uh, Shalini. Yeah, I would agree with uh, with the chief that um, you know we have to look at this in a bigger way. This is there is systemic issues here, and I would really, really hope for all the people working, the police working for our town, that. You know, we're very grateful for the culture, for the work they do, and um, and what we really need is for us. But at the and at the same time, there what we're hearing is the systemic ways that people are getting affected. They may not be too many people, but the fact is there are people there who are being affected, and it's not because of the police. So I really do hope that the police are not taking it personally, which I'm sure they will because it's hard not to with all the thing, but at least I can speak for myself and I believe all the town councilors here feel that too, that uh, you know, we really do appreciate the work of the police and we're really looking forward to working with the police and you have all the experience um, in, in working towards, in a long-term way, um, continuing to work and find ways we can invest in our community and empower our youth or close up the education gaps, see how we can support the businesses and um, of minorities. And so there's a lot of work to be done and I believe we have to do it together. Thank you. George. Thank you and I, I agree with you. Again, just quickly, but um... The only proposal that I heard and have heard 
that this committee seems to be wrestling with from a group of citizens is to defund the police at 52%. No other proposal that I'm aware of has been presented. That's a very, very bad idea, period. And so watching you struggle to figure out what to do with a bad idea just baffles me. Um, there's a larger issue at stake here, I agree. And a conversation, many conversations need to be held. As the chief just pointed out, people at the table would include the social service agencies that provide these services, the police and a whole host of other people. That conversation is one that we need to have. But offering to, or thinking of, of, def, of, of freezing positions in response to a very bad idea makes no sense to me. If there was other ideas on the table, at least I could think about, oh, maybe that makes some sense. The idea in front of us that was presented to us over and over and over again, almost in the same language, in my humble opinion, was a profoundly bad idea. So I don't see why you're struggling so hard to figure out what to do about a really bad idea. Now, the underlying concern, I understand and I appreciate. And a conversation about that and figuring out how we could move forward with that makes a lot of sense to me. But freezing positions that will almost certainly hinder the ability of our police department to provide for basic public safety makes no sense to me as a response to a very bad idea. I, you know, just I'll let Dawn to speak for, I mean, Kathy can speak for herself on the subject, but she and I talked about it this morning. And uh, the idea, the question of the freeze came up not in response to the 52 percent proposal the discussion came up in really the context of the original discussion that we were going to talk about how we could look at other professionals to work um, to take over some role in responding to mental health and other issues where it might be a more appropriate way to respond to a small to a segment and whether a freeze in positions might be a helpful transition point to enable us to be able to move from where we are to what we would envision which was really how the discussion was going with um Lynn, the lynn pat and Shalini were having before this 52% thing came up. So I think that, that, you know, the freeze came up in that context, not in response to the 52%. I don't think that's how it will be seen in the public, but that's perhaps a different issue. Kathy, do you want to? Um, yeah, I would just say, I think we have to do a good job with words, George, if, you know, in terms of public perception, because I, I used as a, you know, a transition point. I mean, I would never want to cut people who are current work working for us. And, you know, I would try to avoid that. So the, both the pipeline taking a while to find the people to hire, this buys us time. And it's not, and I, I, I agree with the idea that a regional approach to mental health maybe a long-term thing we want to do, but knowing how poorly mental health is funded, you know, I actually thought we may find a different kind of person we could hire and we could call them, give them whatever name you want to give them, you know, put them in the police department the way we have parking enforcement officers now that aren't real police academy officers. Um, so I don't know whether they exist, um, but it would allow us time to make that decision, leave the money in, and leave the money in the budget. So if we come back and decide it needs to be police um, in the traditional pathway, we, we could still do that. So I think it's um, putting some flexibility where in the current budget, we have no flexibility. If we could set a million dollars aside to say what else we want to do, but I don't see that, but, and I don't see it next year either, um, you know, in terms of how tight the budget's going to be. So this, this allows time to think and come back with 
how might this work? How might this work? And of course, it would involve uh, people like Chief Livingstone and Bill Laramie and people who are veterans of trying to know how they can't currently use their time. Um, so it's, yeah, so I, I think trying to write it in a way that it's not, well, someone said 52%, so here's 10% or 5%. You know, it's not, that wasn't it as much as um, allowing us time to think and holding the money is the, the way it would be thought of. And we can put a time limit on, I mean, Paul is still here on, you know, the, the notion of, you know, is it in within six months we would make a decision, within eight months, you know, something that would say it's not like it's, for, it's a forever, um, but would come back with this is what we've looked at, the community has been looking at different things. You know, the larger reparation, Shalini, you know, with the, the bigger picture, um, we're going to have to get some state foundation. Uh, when you go to Ash, if you're in Asheville, North Carolina, I don't know whether you've been there, but it is an extremely wealthy community. <laughs> and I can imagine that there's some, there might be some deep pockets that could be thinking that way about it. So it's, it's one of these gated communities, um, you know, where the, house, the big houses are behind the gates. Um, but in any case, I just, that was the sentiment. It wasn't so much a bad idea came to us, so now what do we do? But it's been percolating along on, should we be thinking, could we be thinking differently? How might we think differently? Uh, yeah, I think that the other thing that I ask Chief is, how frequently do and regularly do positions turn over in the department? And if you don't freeze positions now, will six months from now there be three positions? And are there always some vacancies? So the <clears throat> freeze at the appropriate time may be a good idea, but the freeze now isn't a good idea. So, um, Chief, is, is there a regular turnover in the department and is predictable thing? There has been a regular turnover recently. Um, I think I mentioned in one of my reports, we got a couple of retirements the last few years. We've also had a couple of officers leave um, for other agencies. That's less, that's less usual than, you know, officers retiring. People don't tend to leave Amherst PD very often for other agencies, but we are transitioning to a younger agency because, you know, you know, a few of the older officers have retired and will be retiring this summer and probably next spring as well. So, you know, you know that's the type of turnover we usually see is from retirements and, and it's not from um, officers leaving for another agency. But, um, you know, we've been pretty consistent where, 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 where we have been is uh, with our numbers and the, you know, 45 to 48 officers in the last few years. Um, and again, when somebody leaves unexpectedly, we had an officer leave for the state police unexpectedly in that position. It took a year to fill that position. So, you know, but nor under normal circumstances, we don't see a lot of turnover in our agency other than for retirements. Okay, uh, shall we? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think addressing Kathy's point about the reparations and the kind of money that would involve. I agree. And I think it's about more than that. It's about intentionality. And as leaders, what are our intentions? Because we do have people who are wanting to step up and there are businesses, local businesses. In fact, the email that I got and I shared with everyone about the reparations comes from a business leader who wants to do something about it. So we have all these people, we have the resources, and some of the things are not even about money, but they might be about what we heard in the Saturday workshop was the education curriculum and the lack of uh, history about black, uh, black history and so forth. So it's a lot, it's, it's really about an intentionality as leaders and the discomfort of change. It's not gonna be easy and we are gonna have to let go of some of the things and privileges we're used to. Like we are used to having 50 people or 48 police people and it is gonna be hard to have 46 or 44, I don't know. I'm just saying. 
So it's not going to be easy for us because we've gotten used to, but we also have to think about what we're hearing now more louder than ever, and we cannot ignore it, is the fact that there are people who are going to way worse stuff than us losing two police cops or having the discomfort of, you know, something that we're used to. So that is going to be part of it. And I think as counselors, we need to dis decide what sort of leadership we want to, um, what, how do we want to show up as leaders and how do we work? It's not an either or, it's not that we're siding with the people who demanded 52%. That's an idea they proposed and we heard them and there was some value in some of the things they talked about, but we may not agree with the 52%. And it's not that we're siding with just the police because yes, we love our police and we're so proud of them. And, and yet there is stuff that we need to do about all this. So we can come in as leaders who are looking at the bigger picture and then starting to do and create that intentionality and then we'll figure out the pieces use up all our resources our academics our businesses our amazing residents and and we find the solutions even if it takes 10 years but we start now uh, you know i uh, i'll just say that there's a lot of things that i probably agree with you there Selini. um It'll be re-educating the, the public, too. Um, you know, it was not unusual 10 years ago for something like a noise disturbance. It would take us an hour, hour and a half to respond to. Sometimes by the time we got there, the noise was over and the, the public was not happy with that. Or, you know, sometimes just certain calls would not be responded to because we were backed up so much. Um, and the public didn't like that so much, or when you tell them that, you know, we can't respond to certain calls or we're cutting services, um, they just need to be educated about that. I'm really, really concerned about, for instance, COVID calls when the students return. Um, there's certain things we're just not going to be able to do, and the public doesn't like that. So I will need your assistance to educate the public that, look, things that you've expected and appreciated in the past may not happen it just might not be like that anymore and so i agree with you some people have gotten spoiled with the job that we've done as police department because i am very very proud of what we've accomplished and, and what we do and maybe that is going to be the new normal that you know you can't call the police department when 15 kids are hanging out and enjoying a day and that's not our job anymore or you know if somebody's misbehaving that that, that might be the new reality you're right but it just will become an educational component that the, the townspeople will need to understand. Mary Lou. Okay. <clears throat> um, if this is, <clears throat> uh, and, it, and it is an important um, position in the town, I think it should be established and not taken from the police department. Um, you know, we're talking about extremely significant changes. I mean, it may seem rather simple, but I, but it isn't. Um, is there any reason the counselors can't go forward and develop a plan and gather, you know, information from a broader group of people in town? And you can do that through your district meetings. You can have a forum and you can begin to plan for your guidelines for the manager for FY22. But I think you need to not only include, you know, you're talking about the um, uh, public health people and counselors and so forth, but also the people who use the other services, the business owners in town, the BID, um, Boys and Girls Club, um, the league, uh, all of those people and more, and the people who are suggesting those changes. There ought to be a forum that you can do this over a period of time, as Lynn suggests, and then be ready for your guidelines to the manager for FY22. And I guess where I stand on this is I would support the manager's budget as presented and not freeze any positions. Um, I'm really concerned about that. Uh, we are we don't have the full staffing in, and we never will because we. We utilize our, our people in, in a lot of good ways, but kind of that's that's what I'm getting out of listening 
to all of this. I think we have time to plan for the FY22 budget. It gives us a lot of time to bring all these groups together and, and decide what the policing in Amherst will be. And if, if it needs support from other areas, then that's where those uh, positions should be reflected, in public health or wherever. So that, that's kind of where I am. So I think the one thing that I should add to that, and then um, I'm going to see if I can propose something to summer, uh, see if we can agree that that's where we are. I think that the discussion has also been that there are some calls that um, police are in a position to have to make because there is no other mechanism to, to do that. And I think that there's also an, a question in there as to whether there are a sufficient number of those calls that actually would allow for a reduction in the size of the force. I don't think that there's a conclusion that that's the case, but that was where we started from, that there is that possibility. And I think a lot of it had to do with around homeless and mental health as a population and um, just a, a status. And that in those circumstances, that if there was the, um, another response mechanism that um, might be more comfortable to the people who were responding to, that we would consider it. And I think that that's why it started out with some idea that well, maybe we don't need the police to do this, we need somebody else. And I don't know whether that came to a funding question, I think is actually a valid question in what you're raising. I think what we need to do, and this gets back to, this, to summarizing where we're at, um, we're required by the charter to have a budget hearing. Committee? convened a budget hearing. We heard from a large number of people. They presented to us um, a fairly uniform position that we needed to make a substantial 52% cut in the size of the department in order to achieve um, essentially that and a much vaster goal. That this committee, looking at it, uh, agrees that we should be looking at other models, but um, supports the, con the this continuation of services because there is no other service to replace it. And um, that we, uh, on the other hand, also want to recognize that if we develop a new model, we want to make sure that we have the ability to transition to that new model. And um, the, the idea of a freeze is one option that we discussed. And um, a freeze could be instituted immediately. A freeze could be instituted sometime in the future. Uh, make essentially that kind of a report with the additional information that the chief has previously provided and hope you can get the written report to us. And then uh, is the bottom line exactly where Mary Lou is saying, therefore for FY21 support the manager's budget. And um, that would be what we would tentatively write up, but not vote on today, because we said we weren't going to vote today. So, Kathy? I would like to vote on this, and we said we weren't going to vote on it, but vote on it tomorrow, if we're meeting tomorrow, because um, I think we have two points of views here, view here. I, I agreed with almost all your sentences, Andy, and I would love to just tape them and write them down. <laughs> but I think a freeze, and I, you know, I started with two, enables a transition if we want to make one in the next 
12 months rather than a promise of maybe someday we'll make a transition. Because I don't think we're going to miraculously have more money in a budget that we can just add positions. And so I, I guess I will emphasize again, I'm not even saying they wouldn't be in the police department. I can imagine hiring a different kind of a person. Um, I, you know, the, the police chief gave us some reasons that ride-alongs don't work quite as well the other day. But so I just think we should be voting on um, two alternatives, which is one is full support of the budget as it's written with those words, and um, we want to encourage Ning, or um, a freeze, and someone would have to tell me how to write it to make it clear that it's not that the positions therefore will be cut, it's that within X months we come back and say, what do we need to do in FY21 or what can we do in FY21? And it, at least I'm partially hearing we're not likely to fill those vacant positions in the fall of this year right away. So right. we're going to be, when the students come back, we're going to be working short staff if we're going to be below staff. So trying to write it in a way. So I would just like to um, honor, and I, I know I'm supposed to word it as a motion, so I'll do it some more formally tomorrow to have a formal motion, but get a sense of the committee. And if the majority goes against that, I would at least like it then to be reflected in the finance committee's report that we took a vote, and this is what the outcome of the vote was, so that the full council can then consider this. That would be my yeah. way of um, handling this. Certainly, if that's the way, uh, anybody on the committee who makes a motion that has a second will have discussion of that particular motion. If that motion is rejected, there's a minority. If the motion is accepted, but not by a full um, contingent of the voting members of the committee, it still is a majority and minority opinion. So both um, are then reflected in the report. And when it gets to the council, uh, whoever is, uh, uh, however it comes out, the minority position can make a motion at the council and it's been presented. I don't, I think that that's, how the process works. And I just want to say for the rest of the budget, you know, I've, I went through all the details. The rest is uh, move forward. Um, I had a couple questions of areas, but it wasn't like a change this. And I think we can flag those. Um, Bob had some nice issues for future discussion at the finance committee that it wasn't needed to be resolved now. So it is this one um, line item in the bigger budget. Okay, Mary Lou. Okay, one of my thoughts is that we're already almost at August 1, and that if, if we didn't put a, um, a freeze on, the next budget starts July 1, and you could already be preparing for that. You'd have more information about where the town wants to go, where you as a council want to go, and can incorporate it into the FY22 budget, which begins July 1, and, and you can move along at that, at, at, during that time. So it's a matter of, okay, if we go, if we accept the manager's budget as presented with some of these minor things that you're suggesting, Kathy, then we have the opportunity to put it in our plans for FY22, which, be, which begins July 1, uh, 2021. So I'd like that included because I think it's important to see that there's very little difference in time here. And it could, we could move forward and really do a good study in this period of time we have before developing the FY22 budget. Even though it may not be, the times financially may not be any better, but at least I think it shows really thoughtful planning. 
Yeah, if your hand is up, is that from uh, before? Yeah, I would just want to respond. Um, you know, I don't disagree, Mary Lou, that the new year is not that far away. I just, we have this opportunity because there are vacancies. We don't know if there will be vacancies. So it just happens to be, if we were looking at the police force at its full complement right now, I, I would not be talking about this. It's more that we have them. Um, so we, and I, you know, there's this horrible, we oh, don't like to use cliche terms, but necessity is the mother of invention. You find creative ways to do things when you have to do them. Um, when you're just sitting and deliberating, deliberating the, the, the oomph to do them. So, um, you know, as, you know, I may, it may be that the sense of the committee, the majority is going to want to do endorse, as I said, nothing else in the budget is equivalent with the numbers. So I'm not, you know, that is not part of it. Um, so I would just like to put it to a vote tomorrow is what I'm going to propose it with a motion tomorrow and put it to a vote. Okay. So I have one additional suggestion so that we can move on to, um, see if there are other issues in the budget people want to talk about and then the report which is then completes the agenda but that is um paul you've been listening to the entire conversation if you have any thoughts about how to assure that there is the flexibility that um, kathy is concerned about um that you have until tomorrow because the committee's not voting on it today to make some suggestions you don't have to respond to me now um but um at least it's 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 out there as a possibility and i think we know where we're going so paul's given the thumbs up so i think we don't even need to go beyond that so chief um i don't think that there's anything else that we're going to talk about because we're going to turn to other, other relating to police. I think we're going to turn on to other things, but, you know, please sure um, staff in the department that um, at least within the council that there isn't the negative negativity that they were hearing about from people who are commenting to the council and that we have a lot of appreciation for what your department and every member of it is doing every day. So thank you for being with us. You're welcome, Andy, and, and thanks for those comments. And I'll make sure, you know, we communicate every day with the officers about what's going on. And I don't think anyone feels it's coming from the, you know, town council, so to speak. It's, you know, some of the things they're just hearing either in the newspapers or word of mouth, that sort of thing, or having watched some of the Zoom meetings that we've had, just, you know, got them a little on edge. But um, I appreciate those words, and I'll make sure that the word gets out, that you guys are supporting us, and, and we appreciate that. Okay, thank you. All right, thank um, you. So um, where we are at is the, um, I need to ask a question of the Finance Committee and other counselors um, who are present who may have um, contributions to make to answer to this question is, is there anything else in the budget that was proposed by the town manager that is a concern or needs, are there are further questions to ask? Um, because this is the opportunity is then we need to be thinking about um, what it is we're going to be voting on tomorrow in the report. I don't see any hands up right now. So it doesn't appear that there are other department, anything else in the budget that was, uh, I know that there's, uh, I, I should say, and I, I just see that Sonia is waving her hand. So I think that she has something, but there's one thing that has been expressed and uh, that is that I think that a number of us haven't said it out loud, but we're nervous about the precariousness of uncertainty with um, both revenue and expenses because of this extraordinary time that we're in. And um, 
therefore flexibility still remains um, a desire and we're also very anxious about where we're going to be a year from now. Uh, so I, I, yes, Sonia. Well, I wanted to just remind everybody that um, I, when I said that um, great for the finance committee to see all the um, change council orders we need to do, we still have the borrowing authorizations. So I'm trying to understand the process for that now because in the past for um, town meeting, it was always part of that town meeting warrant and we had these borrowing authorizations. With the council, it, it kind of got a little strange on us here. So Guilford's ready to move on some of these and he needs to get them voted. So I'm trying to figure out, they're part of the budget. Does this mean it's already gone through the public hearings and all that? So when these finally come to you as a change order, you're all set. There's not gonna be all the meetings and the, I'm trying to understand the process here. Okay, let me see if I can uh, do something and see if I can put something on the screen here as sharing. Is this the document you're referring to? It was number one from yesterday, yep. So if you scroll down. Let me scroll down. 2109, I believe. 2109. So there's those four borrowing authorizations for the enterprise funds. And they are in the budget book. And it's all part of this budget. I'm not saying this has to be acted on for Monday or anything, but I'm worried about having to go through a whole, it's part of the budget. How does it fit in for the public hearings and the forums? I think that anything that was in the budget book is, and was recommended by the town manager's budget was subject to the hearing. The fact is that we only heard about uh, five pages of a very long document um, was just the way the nature of that process goes. Right, this is why I so did- So while I have this on the screen, let's, uh, the ones where we have, the, the first four lines are ones that we've already had votes on. Right. And then 2104B is the motion that we will be considering for the entire budget as recommended for the operating. Right. And that includes within it all of the subcategories um, that are listed under everything that goes with the, the blue section. Yes. So that's, a, and that's going to be as done as one order. Yes, and you have that order. Yes. That's and okay. um, so that's, uh, but that's pretty straightforward. I think that everybody can see it. And if there are any comments or questions about it, let me, I, my problem is, is that, um, I don't have the ability to see, uh, to share on the screen and to see uh, participants at the same time. So, Lynn, if you just have to, if, Andy, you, yeah. um, you have to take, dot, not let your screen be full size. So, push the button that says reduce, and then you can pull up to see raised hands. See if I can. I have my hand raised. And my hand raised is to basically say, not only was it in the book, but we had separate hearings for the water and sewer rates where these projects were totally discussed. Okay. And we had the discussion about enterprise funds during the budget process with the, with the finance committee. We also covered that. But it's in the book. We passed the budget. We passed the budget. It's okay. different from town meeting. So, so let's go back to the orders that are at hand. 2104B is the first. 2105A is um, for the cap program. That's that was done last year. Say again. 
That one is already voted by the council. We're all set. Okay, and then 2107 has been done. That's the Community Preservation Act. Then 2108 is borrowing authorizations for Community Preservation Act. That one we postponed. Right. Actually, that one's off the table now. Yes. 2109. Is the one is I'm talking about. The one that you're talking about. And that will be a separate vote, but is part of, was part of the budget book. Right. If, therefore, yeah. it's, it's, um, people would have had the opportunity. We will need to discuss that and include and explain it in the report. There All right. Questions about it? I'm not asking you to vote it for Monday night. I'm just, I just know that you've got a lot going on for Monday night, which is the regular operating budget. So I wasn't pushing that. But what I was asking about that, if, if we don't include it, will it, it'll, will it be fine to not have the meetings and everything? Because we've already had those meetings. And Lynn just answered that question. I think we're ready. I mean, and once do you, do you anticipate that just being on Monday night to be done with it? You, if you want to, I've got the order, a draft order. I can email everybody right now. Let's do uh, it. Because once we get past Monday night, unless we carry over to Tuesday, unless we have to carry over even all the way up to June 20, July 29th, then we are into town manager evaluation. And I don't even want to tell you about the agenda items that I've thrown off the July 20th agenda. If we, if the finance committee is ready to recommend for the council to vote on all of this, let's clear that up on tomorrow and get it done. Kathy so, uh, I was just going to so, say, that uh, the one other one, Andy, um, Sonia flagged it yesterday, but it's 2111 and we have that one. That's an easy one. I mean, we discussed it already, but um, that's the optional uh, pieces, exclusions for the assessor's office. So that's flagged on this page that's on your screen. Just email that order to you as the draft. And you, you sent the revised version that had the correct second page. For the 2111, yes, I did that yesterday. So 2112 is not something you're expecting to happen now, or do you want this to be done? That's only, that's after free cash is certified. I do this for all my financial articles so that I can track it, but only the ones that have dates on them and stuff are the ones that have been acted on. So you don't uh, do the transfer to stabilization till the closer to the audit. Not until free cash is certified. It's just it's just my sh internal, my right. sheet. So what we're looking at is um, the operating budget 2109, which you've just sent to us, and uh, the optional tax exemption 2111. So you have three orders. Three orders. OK, so tomorrow. When we vote, we will um, see about taking positions on those three orders. And can we make sure that those three orders are in our packet and therefore we know exactly what's there and has to get done? Right, I'll send them to Athena. Thank you so much. Yep. Kathy, did you have anything? Amazing work, you keep us on track. I try. No, I just didn't take my, I didn't take my hand down. I'm scrolling to look at her. I've got it up on my screen too, so I could scroll, but my hand's down. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point because uh, we're done talking about that document. So I think we know what we're going to vote on tomorrow. And uh, we've had nobody who's, who's said that they have any other discussion items other than the one that's been already flagged about police department budget and whether to freeze some portion of it to freeze to position, reduce some portion of it to freeze two positions unless um, another uh, mechanism to achieve the same result is suggested to us by the manager. And uh, so that gets us back to the report. And uh, I think 
um, I appreciate all of the work that everybody's done on the report. I will do my best tonight to pull something now together. Um, my, in, my vision of the report is to have it be an introduction that says something about what an extraordinary year we are under, um, the recognizing the process that we have gone through and um, getting us very quickly to the recommendations and having the largest portion of it, of the discussion, have, um, writing up something about the discussion that we've had regarding the police department. Uh, I'm contemplating, but when looking for your input as to how you feel about this, of even though I appreciate with all of us have been doing a lot of work on other sections of the budget to let the report focus on those things as described and just get it to a succinct piece that can get to the attention of the uh, council and focus the council where it needs to be. And, and therefore I would have to add something about the two additional orders so that they know exactly what they're being asked to vote on and what each of the orders is. Lynn? I haven't read other people's sections, but I've attempted to write mine. Uh, and I find myself just basically going back to what's already written in the budget book. And I'm sitting there saying, why do we have to distill the budget book down to a shorter report? Is that really something that the I mean, something that the council needs? More importantly for me is, you know, the Sean and, and Sonia and others have gone to great pain to answer a ton of questions that we've thrown at them. And I would rather see us do a report that is very much like you described, but not get into regurgitating what's in the budget book, but reflect this rich discussion about the police and all of, I mean, I don't know how you'd ever capture it all, to be honest with you, and then attach the responses to these questions. I mean, we have, we have enough attachments from additional presentations that were made to us that it's as big as the budget book. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, do you want me to just sit there and say, the town council budget was increased because it, to X amount because it was 88% 80, or whatever. And it's because we're actually reflecting the truth now, which is that the town clerk is in our budget. I mean, yeah, you already said that in the budget book. So I'm trying to figure out what, what else am I supposed to say than either the questions we asked or that's it. And I wrote copious notes yesterday during general government. That is the, I think what the question is. Um, with town meeting, it was uh, different that town meeting did not get the budget book and town meeting had a lot of members who would never have looked at the budget book Sometimes I wondered if they looked at the finance committee report, but the idea of uh, narrowing it down. The one exception that I have to which you say has to do with elementary schools. Uh, and um, that's because we had the town manager's budget, we had the library budget that talk a lot about program um, and then relate program to goals and goals to budget um, but the but the schools didn't do that i wonder if we should just take what mary lou wrote up which was really um, for, uh, more extensive and attach it as a separate report and just acknowledge that um, because the uh, schools were uh, 
not able to produce a budget or did not produce a budget book, a budget equivalent to the library and the town managers from municipal departments that um, we're attached, we've, um, one of our members has done this and so give, put Mary Lou's in as a accompanying appended document along with the questions and answers. I'll do whatever counts the uh, committee expects. Just does, does anybody, Kathy? You, had your yeah, hand. Um, you know, I was going to build on what I I was going where you were going, Lynn. Um, but uh, I have a slight twist, and I'm willing to offer my services as I suggest this. I I like the idea of putting the Mary Lou and explaining that the elementary school came to us in a different way. Yeah. We also don't have the same Q&A where we sent them a lot of questions in advance and a document with them responding. We got a lot verbally from them. So I think that's another reason. And I was gonna offer to take the document that Sean has already compiled of all the Q&As and try to distill it into other, beyond the budget book, other things we learned and just put it in by departments because a few times it said get to you later <laughs> or you know um more to come um so you know just uh because i th i thought we got some um but it wasn't to still it in a paraphrase it so uh, like guilford you gave us all the the vehicles that dpw has and you know an, an account so just a slightly more polished q a um and bob and my draft report which you haven't seen picked up on some of that we tried to focus it the other one that came out in dpw is he said in the future we're going to have to deal with stormwater and then during the meeting it's one to multiple millions so it's some it's an alert it doesn't it's not this year's budget but i think it's important for people not to be stunned when they go from stormwater may be an expense item too. It's not just a little expense item, it's a big one. So, and that's in the responses. So that's where we were picking from responses. So it, that would be the very, two, so an appendix that's the education and appendix that what we learned in the review that went beyond what you can find in the budget book. But still give them the attached answers. Yeah, or the attached answers. And I'm just saying, you know, that it might be, a little bit more polished than the way we got it, but I'll look again at it. I mean, Sean can tell me what he thought it, as he was compiling it. You know, a few of them, the question is asked and then it's not answered, but it's answered to come. Um, but so we can, or we could, maybe when I look at it again, it just works as the whole document. It is one Wait, document right now. Because my other option would be to take the general government categories. I think there's eight to 10 and take the questions that I asked and the discussion and what the budget book says and come up with a, you know three or four pages basically saying this is what the department head told us this is what the budget book told us and this is the additional questions we asked and here's the answers to them well i wrote up enterprise funds already and i would say 50 percent of what i wrote is pure budget book and 50 percent was what i heard in the committee you know like you know just better understanding of what I was seeing, including that whole discussion on the transfer station, you know, how much trouble is it in? Um, are we in, at risk? Can we close it down, not close it down? But it, it was, they're not, I got all four enterprise funds Lynn, on a page and a half. You know, I didn't write very much. Um, yeah. So well, I just don't know whether, I think you're right. People want to read the shorter version. I have no idea. Um, does any, if they don't want to read it and they don't read it, then who are we writing for? You know, is the other question. Yeah. I just, I want to suggest, and I want it on the record for next year, just like Sean is saying, please help us think about how to improve the budget book. I want us to think way far ahead about what it is a finance committee really needs to be able to write up versus assume 13 counselors got a budget book. Assume that to the extent they're gonna read it, they're gonna read it. And those very same people that are gonna read it are also probably gonna read the finance committee report. 
what is, I mean, I think the richness of the discussion around police, and I totally agree on the elementary school piece. And if others have written up and I'll do it, I'll just do it. I, I just, but I'm sitting there just. Yeah, no, I'm not suggest. I'm not suggesting you, I didn't think we heard anything that was new insights. So I think there are whole sections that that's totally true for. And I, the one other area, Pat, I didn't read your piece yet on police and fire. Um, we, I passed it on to Andy and was stuck with it when it came to recommendations, which I thought all revolved around staffing, et cetera. And I also feel like it was a repeat basically of what's in the budget book. Um, not so that I, think, I didn't spend time on it. But. We didn't get to in the discussion on fire, fire EMS was the one we had last fall where right now yes. they're not coming to us talking about staffing being in crisis, partly because UMass went home, <laughs> you know. So we had talked about um, the town manager updating the staffing study and it's a town manager goal. Um, so that's, it's not, nothing to do with the F, but it, it was. Right. But that was in part of what I wrote for Andy and that was where I got stuck. Where do you go? Right. You know. Yeah. So it was just one other thing I think to flag. So it has nothing to do with, is this budget the right budget? It had, yeah, exactly. we, still need, we still need to do that, um, right? Yeah. Yes. Well, there were other issues. Um, it, it, uh, the question of e, uh, what ECAC envisions and what the budget re implications are for ECAC's recommendations is something that um, we envision is an ongoing issue and we don't want to lose that. And there are others. Uh, that was just another example. It was pretty on that same list. And that was why when I did my original piece, I keep coming back to that list of issues because that included both the fire and the ECAC housing was in one of them, making sure mm -hmm. that we continue affordable housing efforts it was the third one. I can't remember, there were, there were a couple others. Andy, I just want to point out, Mary Lou has her hand up, so. Yeah. Oh, the, the, um, if the school committee or the uh, uh, central office puts out a budget as they did when Sh uh, Sean was there, you wouldn't have what I wrote up. I think I agree with all of you say this uh, manager's budget, it's excellent. And people should take the time to read it and, and get everything out of it. So why pull things and make it a shorter version? They really should read it. There's a lot of information. So um, I could see why it's difficult to write up on each of these departments because the information is here. And I would go along with what some of you are suggesting. Uh, as as next year, but I think the next year the council should have the uh, the, the full school document um, that you get from similar to what you get from the manager, and then it wouldn't have to be written up as I wrote mine up this year. And you all, it's a huge part of your budget. You should have both the regional document and the elementary document, so you can see where the money is being spent. Yep. Agree. I agree with that. I just also want to just be incredibly, incredibly sympathetic to the schools who right now are just trying to figure out how to bring students back. I mean, it's their job right now is so far beyond the budget. And I just want to, I have to say that. <laughs> uh, no, but excuse and me. And why they did what they did. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, but these budgets were developed before January. They weren't developed just now. When, when we were, the old finance committee had these in, by January because it's all done by then. So I know now it's hard to, to do some of the things, but, but there was transition also, I know. So it, it wasn't easy, um, but hopefully next year you'll have it. Hopefully, I think that they're good. Schools are going to be in for a tough year ahead too. But we hope they get there. 
Yeah. Okay, I think that's been that's sufficient guidance. I think we've probably pretty much taken care of um, the process today. I will take the time now to try and start writing the piece that I can write and um, see if I can get something to you in advance and we'll focus on the four orders that we have recognized the need to be there and treat it as a uh, finance committee report explaining that we have the we're asking about some four orders and most of it um, it's going to be disproportionately uh, uh, towards police but that's the way it goes I think that's what we kind of recognize what the discussion's been about reflect it so anything else because there is no public who has attended today so we don't I can uh, a shock. <laughs> I uh, do not need to uh, do public comment because there is no public to comment. Thank so, you, Andy. Thank you, so Andy. See y'all tomorrow. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.